Returning this morning is uh, the church bulletin indicates to 1 Samuel chapter 20, and we're reading part of the chapter, but the exposition will be concerned with the entire chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 11 through verse 23. And the author writes, And Jonathan said to David, Come, and let us go out into the field. So both of them went out to the field. Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if there is good feeling toward David, shall I not then send to you and make it known to you? If it please my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not make it known to you, and send you away, that you may go in safety. And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And if I am still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord, that I may not die? And you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. That expression, incidentally, is probably an ancient Near Eastern expression an idiomatic expression for David himself. May the Lord require it at the hands of David himself. I don't have time to discuss that, but that appears to be the significance of it. And Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty. When you have stayed for three days, you shall go down quickly and come to the place where you hid yourself on that eventful day, and you shall remain by the stone easel. And I will shoot three arrows to the side, as though I shot at a target. And behold, I will send the lad, saying, Go find the arrows. If I specifically say to the lad, Behold, the arrows are on this side of you, get them, then come, for there is safety for you, and no harm, as the Lord lives. But if I say to the youth, Behold, the arrows are beyond you, go, for the Lord has sent you away. As for the agreement, or literally the word, of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a time of prayer. Father, we thank thee for the ministry of the word of God. We thank Thee for the way in which the Scriptures in all parts of them remind us again of the fundamental truths of the relationship between the sovereign of this universe and His created beings. We thank Thee for the sovereign God in heaven who determines our affairs, for we know that He is not only sovereign, but sovereign also in loving kindness. And we thank Thee, Lord, for all that Thou hast done for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask Thy blessing upon the whole church of Jesus Christ today, for the entire body of believers who have been brought through the Holy Spirit to give themselves to Him who loved and gave Himself for them. We thank Thee for the confidence that we have in the grace that Thou hast manifested to us through Christ. We thank Thee for the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the assurance of Thy presence with us continually. We thank Thee for a living God who never dies, 
And we thank Thee for the living Spirit granted to us so that we too may enjoy eternal life. And Father, we ask Thy blessing upon Believer's Chapel and its ministries today. Bless the outreach of the Word of God through the radio and through the tape ministry and in other forms of outreach. And we especially ask Thy blessing upon the Sunday school that follows. May our young people and our children and our adults be blessed through the study of the Scriptures and through the Christian fellowship that we enjoy in Christ. We pray for our country. We ask Thy blessing upon it and particularly in these very critical days. And then, Father, we remember those who are sick and who are suffering, who have, are in the hospital or have just been in the hospital, and we pray for them. We ask the Lord thy blessing upon them. And if it please thee, give healing ministry to them. We pray especially for some who are suffering I commit them to Thee and the physicians who minister to them and their family and friends. And we ask that Thou would give comfort and consolation. We ask, Lord, Thy blessing upon our meeting in this hour. May it reflect the glory of our great God in heaven. We give Thee thanks. We look forward to Thy presence with us through this day. In Jesus' name, amen. subject for today as we continue our series of studies in the life of David is the mastering passion of Jonathan's life. A few weeks ago I looked out on the table and uh, there were some books that were offered to you to take home free of charge. Uh, individuals had given books for which we are thankful for the library, but sometimes there are duplicates and some don't really fit exactly what is intended for our library. And one of them was a little tiny pamphlet kind of book giving sermon outlines of Alexander McLaren. And Mr. McLaren was one of the great expositors of the 19th century. In fact, he was called in his day the Prince of Biblical Expositors, and I have for many years read things that he has written, particularly his expositions of the Scriptures. So I picked it up and took it home, and uh, this week I was just thumbing through the little book. It's a very small book, and noticed a reference to John chapter 7 and verse 36 through 50. The title of the sermon was The Tears of Love. Well, it must have been a, a great sermon that Mr. McLaren preached on the tears of love based on the incident in which the Lord Jesus meets the woman that was a sinner. It's a kind of a pantomime story, you'll remember, because she never says anything. And as a matter of fact, no one else seems to say much except a few comments by our Lord. And uh, so it's uh, reflective of the response of an individual who has, by God's grace, been brought to love for Jesus Christ. And the title, The Tears of Love, although I had already chosen my title for this Sunday morning, might well be a title for 1 Samuel chapter 20. The love of the woman that was a sinner was not simply emotional, it was rational. It could give a credible account of itself. It rested upon a fact, the assurance of the forgiveness of sin. It was preceded by the conviction of sin. 
And that was followed by the certainty of Christ's love for her. And uh, the text that comes to mind is the one that often comes to mind to me. We love because He has first loved us. That was her experience, and the tears of love were designed to express what had come to her. Jonathan lo Jonathan's love for David was a similar kind of love except on a different level because Jonathan can in no way be compared with our Lord Jesus Christ except perhaps in some typical fashion. His love was grounded in the appreciation of David and the great victory that he had accomplished and furthermore in the certainty of his coming kingship. Jonathan, like all of the Israelites, had been afraid in the presence of Goliath. And then seeing the mighty victory that David wrought and the fact that he was allowed by God's grace to bring the head of Goliath back to Jerusalem and having his weapons in his own tent instead of Goliath's impressed him greatly. And as a matter of fact, as David spoke with Saul, we read in the 18th chapter when it came about, it, when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Other incidents increased the love that Jonathan had for David, and it's one of the great stories of the Word of God, the expression of the love that Jonathan had for one whom he came to understand was the coming king and to whom out of personal love he gave his own right to the throne of Israel because he after all was Prince Jonathan and David was not that at all. Well chapter 20 records some incidents that reflect this mastering passion of Jonathan's love. The chapter begins in the first 23 verses with an account of the renewal of the covenant of David with Jonathan. David, fearful, escaped while Saul was under the influence of the Spirit in Aoth or Naoth, and uh, now as an outlaw the coming king is very disturbed by the things that have happened and as a matter of fact fears for his life. David's actions in one sense illustrate the dim light of the Old Testament. He expresses himself in the third verse of the chapter as being hardly a step between me and death. He doesn't really seem to understand as we understand now the relationship that a believer has to the Lord God. And the expression of fear, the expression of uncertainty are expressions that reflect the fact that in the Old Testament we do not have the confidence, we, we have believers who do not have the confidence in the life that is beyond the grave that we now have as a result of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. For example, if you compare David's relationship to the Lord with, with Paul the Apostle, there is a significant difference. The Apostle writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 and 10, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The Scriptures in the Old and the New Testament remind us that our life is not the kind of life that we can put our trust in as a permanent thing. James in his epistle says that our life is just like a vapor. Ecclesiastes tells us that we do not have the confidence with regard to the future that now we have by virtue of what God has revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's not until New Testament times that we have the fullness of understanding with regard to the future. So David is very fearful, and he's concerned for his life. And uh, then in verse 12 through verse 17, as the renewal of the covenant is described, there is a further expansion of the arrangements that exist between Jonathan and David. Jonathan's part and David's part are set forth. And here, specifically in verse 14 through verse 17, we have it spelled out. And if I am still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? And you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of, his em of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made David vow again because of the love for him, because he loved him as his own soul. So Jonathan pledges himself afresh to David and calls upon David to pledge himself to Jonathan. It's very interesting to note this reference here to the fact that you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. So while Jonathan has taken off his princely garments and have given them to David and recognizes that he's the coming king, nevertheless, he wants to be sure that David, once he has ascended to the throne, will give the loving kindness of the Lord God to Jonathan's descendants. Now, if you're a reader of Scripture, you'll know that there is a chapter in 2 Samuel that bears very much upon this. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, the chapter begins with, Then David said, he's now King David, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So the covenant was remembered by David, and the stipulations of it were carried out by David to the best of his ability. And that great chapter which has to do with Mephibosheth, I have a friend who was a preacher, and one time we were discussing some years ago Mephibosheth, and uh, I had spoken to him about what a marvelous little chapter it was. And he said, well, it is a great chapter, but I've never preached on it. I could never learn how to pronounce his name. But Mephibosheth, you probably know it, and no doubt you've heard somebody at least speak upon it. So here is the further expansion of the covenant. And I'd like to just make a few references to the typical nature of the relationship of Jonathan to David, who was the type of Jesus Christ. There are many ways in when, which one might develop the typical relationship of David to the Lord Jesus. Remember, the name of David was Beloved, and the one who is particularly beloved of all is the Lord Jesus Christ. His uniqueness is seen in the fact that he is the only Old Testament character with the name David. Remarkable thing. But in that uniqueness, he reflects the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ, for there is no one, of course, like him. Bethlehem, the house of bread, for that's the meaning of Bethlehem, was the home of David. And, of course, as you know, that's where the Lord Jesus was born as well. He was of beautiful countenance, Scripture tells us, and while not thinking of the physical, but of the spiritual, the Scriptures in more than one place remark upon the beautiful countenance of the Lord Jesus Christ spiritually. If you read the 45th Psalm and the description given of Him there, or Luke chapter 4 when He speaks and how they marveled at the wonderful words of grace that were poured out of his mouth. You note the relationship. David was a shepherd, and our Lord is presented in the New Testament as a shepherd. In fact, this is underlined in the New Testament. He's the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He's the great shepherd who perfects the sheep. He's the chief shepherd who will come again. 
and reward the elders. So Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. And David, of course, was the anointed king of Israel. And the New Testament in the accounts of our Lord's birth and his baptism underline the fact that he is the anointed king who will rule over the house of Jacob forever. David had won a great victory over Goliath, a figure of Satan. He was given the kingdom of God that was Saul's at the first. In fact, one can, in one sense, think of Saul as representative of the first Adam, who was unable to do what he should have done, that is, to serve the Lord God in the way in which the Scriptures had placed man there, but now there comes the last Adam, the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and does what Adam the first could never do. And in overcoming Goliath, David ultimately became the king, conquering Jerusalem, so we read. His throne and the Lord's throne are one throne. And in that sense, there is a remarkable likeness between the two, for you remember that the Lord Jesus rules over the throne of David. We read in verse 32 of Luke chapter 1 these words, He will be great, He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. So there was one throne, they were united in the throne. Of course, there are different ways in which the throne develops, but it's the throne of his father David. And so there is a remarkable, typical relationship between David and the Lord Jesus Christ. In his victory over Goliath, he finally takes the giant's head, brings it into Jerusalem, overcomes ultimately Jerusalem, reminding us of the fact that the Lord Jesus, having overcome Satan, has won the right over life and death, and thus is the eternal king who rules over the kingdom of David forever. Now, of course, if it is true that we have uh, a great typical relationship between our Lord and David, then it's not surprising that in the love of Jonathan we have some likeness to the relationship that we should have to our great king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jonathan, when he finishes his statement in uh, verse 18, we read, then Jonathan said to him, tomorrow, well, I should go all the way on down for the sake of time to verse 23, as for the agreement of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. The word, the bond, and the covenant. Jehovah is the witness and the eternal center of their union and the avenger of its shattering. Now, the remainder of the chapter is, uh, I think we can describe it in these words, Saul's deadly anger is ferreted out. The plans that have been set forth in the earlier part of the chapter by David are now carried out. David is ready with an excuse as Jonathan and Saul are at the meal and David's place is empty. David has given Jonathan an excuse that he is to give to King Saul. His uh, plan is this, that if King Saul notices that I'm not there uh, and asks about it, then you tell him that I wanted to go home for the sacrifice that is to take place at home. And we can tell from the way in which he responds to that information about whether he really is seeking my life. And the first day they ate, Saul made no reference to David's absence, but the next day he did. And so he asks, why has the son of Jesse not come to the meal, either yesterday or today? 
And Jonathan answers, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem, for he said, please let me go since our family has a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to attend, and now if I have found favor in your sight, please let me get away that I may see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. Wasn't altogether true, but nevertheless, in one sense, it could have been relatively true. But we read in the 30th verse, Then Saul's anger burned against Jonathan, and he said unto him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. A number of translations have been offered for this Hebrew statement, but probably it means, You perverse rebel. Do not I know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Therefore now send and bring him to me, for he must surely die. Well, it is evident that uh, Saul and his anger are still raging against David. And so now Jonathan, out of love, expresses Saul's intentions toward David in the remainder of the chapter in the little incident of the shooting of the arrows. And uh, incidentally, one can notice from this a further lesson because Jonathan is hated for David's sake. And in the New Testament, that, of course, is the reason that believers are hated. They are hated for Jesus Christ's sake. And our Lord more than once alludes to that, particularly in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of, 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, and then also in the Beatitudes of the Gospel of Matthew. Blessed are ye when you are persecuted for my sake. Well, the plans are consummated, and so Jonathan arises from the table in anger, did not eat food on the second day of the new moon because he was grieved over David since his father had dishonored him. And in the morning he went out to the field in the appointment with David, and he carried his arrows, and a little boy was with him, and he shot the arrows. And in agreement with the arrangement with David, as the arrow was shot and the boy runs out to get them, he yells, is not the arrow beyond you, which was the sign that David was to flee. And so when the dead lad was gone, David, instead of fleeing, rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times, and they kissed each other and wept together. And notice that lovely little clause, but David more. The Hebrew expression means something like, uh, until he magnified. And uh, in the expression, what is to be understood is probably an infinitive. He magnified or he enlarged upon the weeping. And we would uh, render it very freely. He wept to excess. But I like that little expression in the NASB, and they kissed each other and wept together, but David more. Now that's the incident, that's the story at this point, and in the remaining words, I'd like to just enlarge upon what I see in this incident. I do not think it's fantasy to think of Jonathan's devotion to David, the coming king, as analogous to the believer's devotion to Christ. And if so, if that is really true, then think of the glory of Jonathan's choice. Saul said, do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? Think of the glory of Jonathan's choice as similar to our God-initiated devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. His was an utter self-sacrifice, a sacrifice issuing from a deep love. 
In verse 4, Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then in verse 17, And Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. In verse 41, And they kissed each other and wept together, but David more. And one thinks of the great expression in the New Testament that the apostle makes, the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then all died. That's the thing that controls the believer. The love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ constrains us. Now, let me expand further. Note the full acquiescence in David's known desires. We read in verses 12 and 13 of this chapter, Then David said, Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness, when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if there is good feeling toward David, shall not I then send to you and make it known to you? If it please my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not make it known to you, and send you away that you may go in safety, and may the Lord be with you as he has been with our, my father. There is a full acquiescence on the part of Jonathan in the known desires of David. And I suggest to you, my Christian friend, that our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ should be similar. That is, there should be a full acquiescence in our Lord's known desires for us and for the work that he has accomplished. And secondly, there is in Jonathan's case a full recognition of David's supremacy and his own personal unworthiness. Faith in Jonathan saw the coming glory of David. He recognized that David is the anointed king. And as Jonathan saw David's coming glory, so did the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Peter is called upon to make confession, he to the Lord Jesus says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Others say other things about you, but this is what we say about you. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And having been brought to that decision by the Holy Spirit in their hearts, from that time on their lives were devoted to him. Peter in the boat with the catch of the miraculous fish realizes that it is not simply Jesus of Nazareth who is in the boat with him, but he recognizes that the Lord God himself is in that little fishing boat. And he cries out, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He is the king who must reign. And Jonathan sees in David a reflection of him as the king who must reign. One of the most marvelous things in the Word of God is that we may call our Lord Jesus Christ, the chosen one, a friend. And then there is a free surrender of everything dear to his own supremacy. What a noble self-sacrifice this is on the part of Jonathan. He was the prince but a self-sacrifice for high spiritual purposes and more than houses and lands and father or mother. The Lord Jesus, remember, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 29, makes this statement. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake shall receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. Here is Jonathan giving away everything that could have been his, ostensibly, for the, the David whom he loved. David had fought for the name. Remember he said, I come to you in the name of the God of hosts. And the name was in Jonathan's mind as he expresses his submission to King David. 
So, in so doing, he became one with David, loved him as himself. I like to think of that incident in uh, Luke chapter 7. If you'd like to turn over there for just a moment. In Luke chapter 7, the incident of the woman that was a sinner. And we could entitle it also, the woman that was marvelously saved. In this incident, which is a kind of a pantomime, because as I say, she doesn't speak in the incident. It's just uh, an expression in which our Lord takes the central part, and she with her tears expresses the kind of devotion that one should have to the Lord Jesus. Turning to the woman, Jesus said to Simon the Pharisee, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Not water, but tears. Not a towel, but with her hair. Not the kiss of friendship, but showers of devotion. Not oil, but ointment. No church woman with a doctrine, although it's all right to have a doctrine, and the doctrine expresses itself in her life, but a magnificent expression of love for Jesus Christ. I must say, I feel that so often we fail to realize that the things that we believe are the things that lead to the proper kind of Christian living. Often when I, as you know, talk about biblical doctrine, individuals will sometimes comment, we don't need doctrine, we need life. We fail to realize that the kind of life that we live is reflective of the doctrine that we believe. David Brainerd, who had that magnificent ministry among the Indians in his journal, expresses some thoughts concerning his own ministry. And in them he says, I never get aw got away from Jesus and Him crucified. I found that when my people were gripped by this great evangelical doctrine of Christ and Him crucified, I had no need to give them instructions about morality. I found that one followed as the sure and inevitable fruit of the other. That is always true. This woman has come to understand the forgiveness of sins through the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings that are hers as a result of it. And so, in the expression of what she had come to understand, she exhibits the kind of morality that Christians should exhibit and will exhibit when they understand what she understands. I think it's rather interesting, too, that... Uh, in this incident, you can see the kind of situation that takes place in so many of our churches. Here are men in the congregation, so to speak, in Simon's house. They are as near to our Lord as to hear Him breathe. He has entered their house, and uh, many of them had been brought up in the things that have to do with the Old Testament truth, but the men in the dining room with Simon are too self-confident. They are too full of their own virtue. They are too full of their own excellence to be open to the glory of the Son of God who seeks to encounter them. But this poor woman who comes in, but she knows the fundamental essential thing, and that is that she's a sinner, and that Christ in His magnificent love has made provision for sinners and in making provisions for sinners has made provision for her, and her heart has been touched, and now she expresses her love for him in the reality of a true conversion in the midst of religious people who do not understand what is going on. And my friend, I'm afraid that so often even in Believer's Chapel we have individuals within our audience 
who have been in the hearing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are as near to the truth of the Word of God as one can be when the faithful Word is proclaimed in the greatness of the sacrifice of the Lord. But they, like those men in that room in Simon the Pharisee's house, have never been touched by the Holy Spirit and brought to the conviction of their sin and to the knowledge of the mercy and grace of God available for sinners. Sad, but I'm afraid it's true. And so true in our evangelical churches as a whole. There was in Jonathan's case the free surrender of everything dear to his to David's supremacy. He gave him his clothes, the things that went with the princedom, and acknowledged that David was the supreme love of his life. And finally, the thing that we learn at the last is that love is the spring of self-sacrifice. That's the master passion of Jonathan. That's the love that David describes as the love that passes that of women. And it's the power of Christian service. No one will ever serve our Lord effectively who does not serve out of devotion to Him. No ointment too costly, no crown is too glorious for Him, no joy too excessive at the crowning of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love is the motive power that flows from redemption in Christianity. The psalmist who says, as he expresses his praise for the Lord, Thou hast loosed my bonds, has entered into the spirit of Christianity. Because He has loosed our bonds of slavery, we praise Him. McLaren once said, not in this little book that I was reading, but he once said, take the motive power of redemption from sin out of Christianity and you break its mainspring so that the clock will only tick when it is shaken. That's what happens so often in our Christian gatherings. We are busy shaking the clock to make it tick so that we can see some evidence of true Christianity. But the evidence will inevitably fall when the individuals have been touched in their deepest being with the mercy and grace of God. The Lord Jesus speaks about worthiness in Matthew 10 and verse 37. In that verse, He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jonathan is worthy. He loves David more than Saul. Abraham is worthy. He loves the Lord God more than Isaac. He who loves mother, father, anything, more than me is not worthy of me. Jonathan is worthy. I guess the appeal of this, the most natural appeal, is the question that our Lord asked Simon Peter himself. Simon, lovest thou me? That was not simply a question of love. It was a question of love and its fundamental grounds. Simon, do you know the redemption that is in the Lord Jesus Christ? And as a result of that redemption, do you truly love me? Have affection for me as well as deeply love me? So I ask you this morning, giving the words of our Lord that He gave to Peter and acting as our Lord's mouthpiece only, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? May God in His marvelous grace allow you to say, Lord, You know all things. You know that I love You. My prayer is that that is your true response and that it arises out of the fact that you understand that grace has been shown to you. If you're here today and you've never believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, let me remind you that that grace 
is available according to the Word of God. The Son of God has come as the greater David and has offered the atoning sacrifice. I know there are some who like to tell, in effect, tell their children, don't worry about the greater Son of David. Take care of affairs in this life and be a success. But let me assure you that's the way to catastrophe. He has offered the atoning sacrifice, and may God in His marvelous grace so touch your heart that you come to Him and receive the benefits of it in grace. Let's stand for the benediction. <coughs> Father, we are indeed grateful to Thee for the expression of love on Jonathan's part because it reminds us of the kind of response that we should have except in deeper and greater measure to the greater than David, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, Father, enable us to reply as Peter did, Lord, Thou dost know all things. Thou dost know that I love Thee. We ask Thy blessing upon everyone present, and if there are some who have never believed in Him, may at this very moment they express to Him the confidence that they have in the blood that was shed, that which the true and greater Son of David has accomplished an atoning sacrifice. May they respond to it in faith and receive the gift of life. For Jesus' sake, amen. Mm -hmm.